Good morning, good afternoon, greetings and salutations, a good evening to wherever you are. And we are back with the women of BSV today, myself and Ruth, the usual suspects, and the beautiful Osman Callis, who is Block Venture Studios now. So you were Block Dojo and you've come to talk to us about your amazing new venture, Block, Do- uh, Block Venture Studios, which I did come down to your uh events your opening and groundbreaking event in london a couple of weeks ago so welcome to the show osman and thank you for coming and tell us a little bit about your new venture because this is really exciting well thank you first of all for having me on tonight lovely to see you both again Mm -hmm. and also for attending diddy really appreciated you coming along and recording some really lovely footage which was nice because a lot of stuff was captured that night um so it was really nice to have a, sort of an extra record it's a bit like when you have your I guess when you get married and it's it goes like a flash and everybody's telling you what mm. happened and you're like really? it just <laughs> it went like by in such yeah. a blur because you don't you don't yeah. drink you don't you know because you want to be completely try and soak up as, as much as possible but it still manages yeah. to go in a blur so you know your your record of the event was really helpful um my, my twisted so, iphone I did use indeed to do your trusted yeah, iphone I, um, I have done wedding videos in the past as well so have thanks you? yeah yeah so the, the, the venture studio exists because we understand that there are many ways to innovate and there are many innovation models and what we saw with, that was missing in the market was off the uh, sort of off the back of conversations with with corporates who would explore challenges um, and share the challenges that they were facing and then I'd say, well, what are you doing about those? And they say, well, I've kind of been dropped into this position. I've, I've newly stepped into a role as, I don't know, innovation lead for some, some corporate. And I don't really know where to play. And um, I've got to do this thing. And I've never done something like this before. Um, and now that we've explored challenges together, when I, we asked, OK, well, what happens now? They say, well, we just go back to the drawing board. So what became clear was the venturing side of of corporates takes two two types of routes really one is where they look at opportunities to invest in uh, really interesting up-and-coming startups Mm -hmm. Um, but what a few are starting to do is to think about building their own because there's risk associated with anything new that we want to do to create value it has to be yeah. mm-hmm. and the great thing about humans is that we've evolved ways to take aggressive risks that allow us to outpace our um competitors in the uh, in the natural world um i hope we do have some competitors otherwise you know we're not staying sharp and uh, ad- ad- evolving as, as 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 creatures even if we're competing with ourselves yeah and so i think we've got this inbuilt desire to take these risks and to look for opportunities to 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 grow and evolve and companies are no different but what they didn't know is how to manage the risk of innovation so we said we can help you with that we have three really solid competencies which are very useful one is a stable of entrepreneurs the founders of the block dojo are themselves entrepreneurs we have uh, a team of people who really know blockchain in terms of its capabilities. It's not just going to be about one thing, which is whatever the current thing is. Um, we're going to tell you about all of it and, and what the original vision was. For example, the uh, vision of micropayments, which many people yeah. don't realize, even though it's right there in the white paper. And we also have capabilities around incubating uh, startups and working yeah with new businesses. So when you put those three things together, it felt like a a no brainer to offer that out. And we've had phenomenal conversations ever since. So who is uh, one of the first businesses that, you know, one of the first corporate businesses that you spoke to? So the guys who came to the launch have been among the early uh, people that we've started to converse with. But actually prior to that, we ran a couple of events under the auspices of the dojo and that was uh, an area that I was asked to look after and we had uh, 
a couple of insurance companies. In fact, we had uh, one, two, three, four insurance companies. Uh, one called uh, MNK, another one called Superscript, um, another one called uh, Swiss Re, and another one called uh, Munich Re. So those guys were really interested in what we were doing. Uh, and then we ran another event focusing on the construction industry. And yeah. we had, oh, actually also in another company called EIS Insurance, which came to the uh, masterclass prior to the uh, ideation jam. And then on the construction side, uh, we had a company called uh, Kio, which is working with the Saudi government to help design their Neom project. And I think they're also going to get involved in an amazing new project called the Line. Yeah, so I've they do a lot line. of work in the construction. Yeah, have you? It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, yeah, it's a city. It's a city yeah. all in one, in one line that stretches yeah. across um, one of the deserts. I'm not sure which. Um, and uh, oh, another company that builds data centers. Um, it's the biggest data center uh, building company in the world. Um, and so, oh, and Barrett Homes as well. So okay. those were the first guys that gave us the insights that, you know, led to the creation of the Venture Studio. Yeah, because this is obviously something that's really needed, like you say, because mm. they, they're, they're kind of missing these little pieces and you're mm. putting these pieces together in this jigsaw for them and making it a whole. That's some amazing, exactly. amazing people that you've been talking to then as well with some really big projects. I mean, <laughs> crazy. Really yeah. Projects. I mean, I was really impressed because one, you had Christie's there and they were talking about Beeple with the, you know, was it $62 million? Yeah, I thought it was, yeah, for the, F, yeah, the everyday art piece of art, yeah. yeah. And then the lady from ITV and you talking about Funderburg. Yeah, the CCO, right who's uh, actually left ITV since, but. Oh, has she? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. But the Thunderbirds, yeah. um, like, I mean, I'm old. I love Thunderbirds. I used to yeah, love Thunderbirds. I used to love watching Thunderbirds. You know, Thunderbirds ago, and you've got Stingray and Joe Ninety and all of that lot. They were it's great. A really but good choice, too. wasn't it? Yeah, I thought yeah, that really. was very clever because it was a way to engage with slightly older audiences uh, mm. and to bring them sort of to the table because they're probably quite a few of those. Who slightly old. I love you, Osmond. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> at least slightly. <laughs> well, I mean, so you, know, you know, my it's like my dad watched. You know, he's in his seventies. He he watched Thunderbirds. They were around in the sixties, weren't they? You know, oh. so and it's just something that's kept going and going and going. I remember when Tracy Island came out. I think in the early two thousands. I mean, it sold out really quickly, yeah. like really yeah. quickly, and it was really expensive as well. But it just shows mm. that if you've got the right, the right kind of idea, then it can go on forever and ever. Mm. You know, like mm. Coronation true. Street, it's, it's a, a tradition, true. you know. Very so. true. Very, very yes. true. Actually, that's a very good point because Nicholas Nassim Teller often talks about um, an obsession with, with new things, neomania. Mm -hmm. And often when, we, when we're innovating, we think we have to create something brand new in order mm -hmm. to uh, do something special that's going to get people's attention or create value. When actually a lot of innovations are incremental disruptions yes. kind of happen in to leaps oh, don't they sort yeah. of quantum leaps but if yeah. you look at things like the design of the chair or you know it's based it, that, that must be over a thousand years old or the design of yeah. eating implements there are some things which we don't really need to change but we just evolve ways to just sort of improve the experience yeah. of, of those yeah. things but yeah. it's still a chair and there's still a sort of a quintessence to it so yeah. that's the thing that you that you discover actually that the, the the various forms of disruption is only one kind of of innovation there's incremental innovation where you take something new and then you just add small changes but overall the the essence of it doesn't change um there's architectural uh uh innovation where you take a model and then you apply it in a completely different context mm. um I quite like those because that tends to be quite attractive to governments and, and large corporates because it's something that they can understand. And again, it's how you manage risk. Um, yeah. But then, of course, there's disruption, which you have to pay attention to. Um, yeah. Yeah. But generally speaking, you take the biggest risk if you're an early adopter. And then as the early majority pile in, they have less risk, but slightly lower rewards, well, ideally, if... Um, the sort of the, the, the economics stack up but uh, I guess that's that's how it's supposed to go anyway.
Um, can I ask, you know, these, um, uh, like you're talking about Barrett and the people who are building the, the giant long buildings? The line. The line. Wow. Mm. Mm -hmm. Keo, yeah. I've already anyway, I mean, what, how, how do they foresee using blockchain, do you think? Is it going to be like, um, you know, uh, tokenizing uh, investment in those buildings? Mm. Or have you got any, have they kind of given you any ideas as to what direction? Yes. Yeah, so a lot of the interest was around uh, smart devices and, and smart environments and, yeah, IoT data. So having connected homes and connected environments and what that means for the, the, the sharing of data, how we keep that secure, uh, how we ensure uh, integrity of that data, who owns it, raises a lot of questions. Um, well, how much of that can be monetized? Who should be monetizing it? So lots of really interesting questions there. Also, um, mobility. Well, actually, actually, two more areas. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, smart mobility as well. And I don't just mean mobility in terms of transportation, but how people get around these environments who might have some challenge. We, we design environments initially for... Um, everyone who is abled in pretty much every physical yeah. aspect. And then we kind of figure out, oh, right, well, what do we need to adapt for yeah. uh, everybody else who might not have the the, the same abilities? In my language but, here, because this is me talking about. Yeah. So yeah. actually what they're doing is saying, actually, why, why are we looking at it that way? Actually, for some environments, we actually ought to start the other way and start mm -hmm. with uh, the most impaired environments. And then if what happens if we design an environment like that? But if we discover that actually some of our um, uh, implementation decisions haven't necessarily panned out the way that we expect. How do we get data quickly about challenges as granular as you, you care to perceive? Mm -hmm. So it might not necessarily be, okay, at this tube station, there isn't a lift. It could be literally as, as uh, simple as I'm walking past a, a shop window and they have... Uh, some sort of uh, screen or barrier to, to visibility, and you only see above the. Say, for example, it could be frosting on glass, but you can only see mm -hmm. you only see above the frosting, and it's assuming that everything that's uh, inside the shop is okay to for the public to view. Um, but maybe it's just a design choice. You see, you have the frosting at a certain level. Well, if, if everybody's going past that shop in a wheelchair, they can't see the sign mm -hmm. necessarily. So, mm -hmm. really small things that we just take for granted. How mm -hmm. can they using the connected environment quickly? adapt and report on uh, some of the design decisions in the environment that might not be working and then update accordingly. So it's all of that flow of information that, and re feedback that they were very interested in. That's interesting. Wow. That's yeah, interesting. That interesting. But, I mean, because also there are other set elements of that. I always go to like, there is a supply chain side of that and then there's the invoicing mm. side. Of that. Say, well, there's going to be so many different ways that they yeah, can yeah, yeah. be looking at yeah. blockchain. It's, it's crazy, mm, really. Yeah. But, yeah, Internet of Things is going to be huge, isn't it? Particularly, presumably, in these really advanced Arab countries where everything's so high tech, you know, from the word go. Yeah. Absolutely. So, IPv6 and all of that, then, we're you talking about trying to basically get everything to have time. A IPv, yeah, IPv6 was just coming on the horizon. So, it's been a lovely way to re engage with people. Say, look, here are some really lovely and interesting new developments that are happening. Send. Uh, recordings of uh, some of the content coming out of the most recent conferences uh, and some of the demos that are are being done. Um, but yeah, no, there's a huge interest there. Mm -hmm. So for people that don't know, IPv4 is what, it's about 12 zeros or something and IPv6 <laughs> is 38 zeros. Something so like that's that. yeah. a, lot of, a lot of addresses that can be put onto IPv6. I, I vaguely recall it was something like as many um, atoms as there are in the universe or something. Yeah, anyway, this then actually yeah. brings in quite nicely the, the question of identity and identifying devices as well as people and how we credential all of the uh, agents which are uh, controlling a, a, an address or series of addresses mm -hmm. um, in such a way that is private but also reduces uh, mm -hmm. issues with, with data breaches etc. One of these subjects is vast though isn't it like mm -hmm. every like hole you look down is is an enormous kind of so I mean what are you just pointing them in the right direction to the the, the best source of information you're actually helping them develop things on? So yeah so it's a good question 
it's lovely to have some of these slightly broader philosophical conversations, but ideally you want to uh, begin at a starting point where you can identify some quick wins. Uh, I'm going to use the overused term low hanging fruit, but it is it does exist mm -hmm. as a term for a reason, um, but also accessible challenges. So we start with a, a, a huge cluster of um, everything one can imagine. Uh, in a particular sector. And then we narrow that down to applicability to blockchain, um, short term, medium term. The other important consideration that, that has to be brought into the mix is what the market dynamics look like around that. Where's the demand for this? Who would be actually willing to pay for such service? Because mm -hmm. you can have ideas until you're blue in the face, but if mm -hmm. nobody's actually willing to pay for them, then that's got to tell you where the value is, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've developed a competency within the Venture Studio called a um, hypothesis validation, where we actually evaluate and validate the uh, ideas by breaking them down into their most sort of concrete but atomic parts, where we can very quickly see, okay, well, because there's a, a, a value in this particular approach, then we should be continuing talking about this. But very quickly you say, well, oh, I don't think anyone would want a solution that did that because, well, who would, how would we get them to pay for it? So then that very quickly falls away. So we introduce this filtering process. So you're actually left with a subset. And then what we do with that subset is down to the client. Do they want to create proofs of work? We then have uh, a period of, of uh, or sorry, a set of activities over the sort of the, the next period of time where we create uh, business solutions, commercial solutions that underpin that particular idea in terms of how much would we charge for it, what size of market, what are its USPs, value proposition, who are the competitors, are there people already doing this, um, is there white space, is that there for a reason, are there barriers to entry, all kinds of... of uh, really to be as is that the patterns well, you know? Right, exactly. Yeah. So, and then finally, once we've convinced ourselves that we've got something that has, because at this point we've still done desk research and predominantly desk research, as quickly as possible we need to get people to uh, validate it with us and tell us if they actually agree with, with our assessment. And sometimes they agree and say, yes, I would actually be interested in that. Um, other times, you know, despite our, our best efforts, we've, we've read it wrong. And so... Mm we can identify something that could have taken somebody running the same business three years they come up with a solution think oh that's really great go away uh create it then find a way to to sell it only to discover after yeah. trying i don't yeah. know a myriad of ways that actually it's not really working so wouldn't it be great if we could iterate through as many of those as possible within a few weeks or months which is what we aim to do that's amazing yeah. That's amazing. Well done. Congratulations. Mm, thank you. Wow. So actually, this is the thing. I mean, I've, I've been, you know, put I put a bit of content from time to time. Um, the the blockchain element marries as a, a an, an enabler as opposed to we're doing this because it's specific technology. No, it's a technology that has certain features. And what blockchain can do is either make it uh, more efficient, make it faster or cheaper if mm. that is a, a requirement, because not always, and actually some scenarios you discover that it might not always be cheaper. But if it's not one of those three things, then we do, you know, we have to question why are we doing it? Mm. It has to actually create some benefit and some value, which means that then anything that does make the cut, we know actually has that innate value as well. That's Presumably amazing. this is something that you were doing at the Blog Dojo, because some people submitting um, their, their pitch text and things, you had to go through a similar process of vetting to be able to decide who to invite to the dojo. That's right? a very good observation, actually, yes. So there is a, a very similar kind of parallel process that happens looking at the, the pitches, which is why so much of the we, – we draw so much on the uh, – the strength and the experience of our seasoned entrepreneurs who can very quickly look at a business and say, okay, that that has legs because of these things, and ask pointed questions, which you know the the the, the founder or would-be founder um, may not necessarily have answers to. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the doors are, are closed. It's more, okay, well, you need to maybe think about that, research that, and then come back again 
if uh, when you when you've got something positive and actually you may decide for yourself oh, actually I, I don't have a strong enough case anymore so maybe I need to rethink my position yeah, yeah I mean we had Craig Massey on the other week and he was sort of saying oh, that yeah. businesses need to be able to pivot and a yes. lot of the time as well and if they can't mm. or they don't want to pivot then you know maybe it's mm. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. So, yeah, it's a big part of it, isn't it? Yeah, really and that's problem. the thing. This is where the, the reduced risk comes in, because if you think about your in, investment of not just money, but also time, mm -hmm. um, certainly in the case of time, which you won't get back, um, the, the risk of protracted uh, programmes and, and projects, which you know really should have been mothballed some time ago, we can it almost acts as a forcing function to get us to those points more quickly. Mm -hmm. So you have to have a certain appetite for failure and to, to be overjoyed when you find something that isn't working, because then that's freeing you up to focus on the things that actually do work. Because as soon yeah. as you get that traction, you have to go all in. You know, it's like making a trade. You can't just say, oh, well, I'm just going to hold some cars on my chest, because if it's working, you do more, you double down. But you can't do that if you've got, you know, if you got too many eggs in one basket i don't know about you but i've found over the last few years that i think sometimes we're just early as well like there's yeah. lots of things to do with tokens that i've been sort of thinking for years well we should really incorporate mm. that but it, it wasn't quite there yet you know it wasn't quite ready yet timing is huge there's yeah. a, a the, the person who is credited with coming up with the concept of the venture studio a guy called bill gross uh, came up with a really interesting t statistic that uh, timing accounts for forty two percent of success or failure of startups. Yeah. yeah. So if you, it's almost like a kind of an uplift that you get if you start at the right time because the con prevailing conditions or right. something else that you can't control is actually with you rather than working against you. And so you need to know if you're actually hitting that, which is why um, all of this analysis hopefully tells us. Yeah. I have some experience with that myself. I started a content yeah. management company back in uh, two thousand and one, which is just after oh, yeah. this big dot-com crash mm -hmm. um you know and it wasn't it was a kind of a useful thing at the time but it very quickly became outdated because you know right. like of wix and you know online mm -hmm. you know uh, web yeah. design so yeah. it, it died very quickly yeah. but like, you know you have to sometimes just hit the market and try it and, and fail you and do exactly run. exactly yes yeah. you, exactly that you, been approached by scientists or anything i'm intrigued to sort of because i see quite a lot of news cases for for science mm. blockchain and i'm just wondering you know are there any big kind of you know projects out there that are run by yeah. scientists specifically or academics that they can see a way i mean there was a lady that was saying about data points and data sets that she'd um mm. you know, up with um mm. for nfts but i'm wondering whether or not there are other use cases for for mm. that kind of thing within mm. the academic mm. community as well mm. we tend to uh have a lot of conversations with corporates because they're at the end of the day they're tasked with creating additional value for you know their ecosystem of shareholders yeah. users consumers partners clients etc so it's easy to to show and to create a path to, to that sort of success. The incentives for academics um, can be slightly different, but what we do find is that academics love, when they are running their own incubator programs, to talk to us about supplementing what they do with a commercially focused uh, sets of content that they can then deliver and incorporate into their own programs because they recognize their competency is around the data and the academia, but it's a slightly different focus because the applied element of a lot of research is sometimes absent. So what this does help is to kind of uh, throw a spotlight on applying on the applied elements of, of their programs. Um, so when there is a, there's a nice kind of marriage that happens when you've got faculties that have an applied element of, of their, yeah. uh, of, of their curriculum, curricula, uh, because then, there's actually a, a path through because they'll often partner with a corporate themselves who may yeah. be sponsoring some element of it. Like, for example, we were speaking to a, a London university that has partnered with AWS, another one that's partnering with a, a prop tech firm. So then that makes it actually an, a nice uh, sort of combination. So you get all of that lovely uh, uh, sort of industry research from them or other types of research, as you say, 
but then you marry that with, with other things which then create quite a all the infrastructure uh, yeah yeah, exactly. yeah I'm thinking, I mean, you know mm. there's ways into say like virgin or nasa or cern yeah. or, you know those kind yeah. of entities really as mm. well you know mm. which mm. are quite well funded yeah. and stuff as well so yeah it, so we've Exactly. We've been approached by a, a, a university to inquire about helping them with some of their uh, blockchain focused uh, programs, because a lot of the universities are, are actually trying to create um, more sort of industry and economically sort of uh, stimulating types of, of outcomes. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, we did have a, a, a conversation with a, a, a large, it was a very early conversation, so I'm, I'm not sure I should, I should probably say, but it's good to uh, are coming in now, which is really good. Mm. Plant those seeds. Indeed. And, and those seeds flourish. So I'm very aware that we've only got you for a short period of time today, Osman, because you are off to do something at seven o'clock. So, and I know ah, that you said you've got something really amazing and some really amazing news coming up. So I'm wondering mm -hmm. whether or not, would you be willing to come back and talk to us again when you... I would love to. I would love to. Ideally around sort of uh, Q2 next year, if that works for you guys, kind yeah. of around sort of early Feb. Um, and then, yes, share the sort of the start share of the next you. exciting chapter. You've got me Excellent. wondering now. Yeah, okay. Cool. <laughs> I'll you tell you what, mean? fine. <laughs> <laughs> Very, thank Excellent. you so much and i will put there is for this interview as well i'll put the link in the description box for the block venture um opening event that you did where you looked absolutely stunning and the conversations oh, were really interesting and so there was a lot of people there as well um so if anybody wants to watch that it is on our channel i'll put a link in in the description box under this this conversation thank you, thank you so Aww. much for your time yeah. you do. thank you so much so lovely to see you all yeah. again both again and look forward to speaking to you again very soon yeah definitely wonderful. thank you so much take awesome. care thank you bye bye thank you bye.